We are delighted here at the College of American Pathologists to be bringing you today's lecture on dermatological emergencies. As I always do, I'd like to start with our standard disclosure. These lectures are designed to supplement your current training program. Content provided in each lecture is at the discretion of the presenter. The CAP did not assist in the development of the content, nor does the CAP indicate these lectures will fulfill any program requirements. Please consult with your program director to determine applicability. Once again, we have a lecturer who has agreed to allow his slides to be tweeted. These are public access, but you are going to see a few slides here that will contain dermatological issues and cases that might prove upsetting to some people. We ask you to use your discretion once again. Twitter is a public forum, so while everything has been vetted and there are no uh, differentiating uh, images here to say who the people are in the photos, we still want to be conscious that these are seen potentially by a large swath of the population. So please do use your discretion on which photos are appropriate to tweet publicly. And with that said, let me welcome Dr. Jared Gardner. Dr. Gardner is Associate Professor of Pathology and Dermatology and Dermatopathology, Bone and Soft Tissue Pathology, and Program Director of the Dermatopathology Fellowship at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, right here in the United States in Arkansas. Dr. Gardner, I'm going to turn things over to you. All right, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Ken, and for everything you've done to support this series. Um, good morning, everyone, and or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. It was awesome to be um, here uh, for the past 20 minutes or so as people were logging in, and Ken was uh, saying hi to everyone from all over the world. Uh, it's amazing that we can have this global community of pathology together um, to talk about uh, pathology this morning. And thanks so much, Dr. Karcher and the CAP for putting on this great lecture series and for supporting it uh, to continue through the end of May. So today we're going to talk about dermatology urgencies and emergencies that every pathologist should know. You may be out there as a resident and, and not be planning to be a derm path, or maybe you're an attending watching this. The goal of this talk is to aim at stuff that's not for dermatopathologists, but for general pathologists who may encounter these issues in general surge path sign out or um, on frozen section or a rush biopsy on a weekend and to know how to handle them. Um, here are my disclosures. I don't think any are, are particularly relevant to this talk, but um, there they are. And um, oh, also, of course, I, I do a lot of social media stuff and I do own some stock in Google and Apple. Uh, but um, obviously not relevant to this talk, and I don't get paid directly by any social media company, um, unfortunately. And these are my my three daughters. This is a few years ago. Um, I'm raising up a, a dermatopathology empire in my my house, and when they're teenagers, I'll recreate this photo. I think. Of course, I have a YouTube channel. Many of you probably know there's a whole bunch of videos on there, uh, so you're welcome to go and check those out. And uh, before we start, I wanted to point this out that last year um, in Archives of Pathology, there, were, uh, there was a special section on dermatopathology for the general surgical pathologist. And that section was put together by um, two of my great colleagues and myself, uh, Dr. Sarah Shalen and Dr. Jennifer Cayley. We worked together and recruited a team of really fantastic authors to write uh, a variety of derm path papers focused on the needs of the general pathologist. So this is a, the, our intro um, editorial that goes through and gives a kind of overview of each of the papers, but those are gonna be the July and August 2019 issues. And those, of course, thanks to the, the wonderful support of the CAP, um, those archives articles are all free worldwide to everyone for download on the archive site. And there's the, the links right there. And in particular, one of the papers that we wrote for this, this special section on DermPath was uh, this paper on dermatologic urgencies and emergencies. So that's basically, I'm going over and giving some highlights from that paper. If you want more details, the uh, paper really goes into great detail about all the things we're gonna talk about today. And really, I have to give a, a shout out to one of my, one of my uh, amazing former derm residents, Dr. Mallory Abate. Um, who's now a dermatologist at St. Louis University, and she really spearheaded this paper and did just a fantastic job. Uh, she's a dermatologist, and she she pulled together the derm side and the path side. And I think, it, to me, the reason that I really love this paper, not just because I'm one of the co-authors, but because we had that collaboration of dermatology and pathology, and we looked at both the clinical and the pathologic aspects of these diseases, and the importance of having that close communication between dermatology and pathology, 
That is so crucial in all of DermPath, but especially in the issues we're gonna be talking about today. Because we're talking about emergencies, but nothing we're talking about today is tumor. It's not neoplastic. It's all this non-neoplastic stuff that doesn't seem very scary because it's not cancer, but it's actually a lot more serious than cancer in some cases. Uh, so it's really important for everyone to be familiar with this and to have that really close communication with your dermatology team. If you're not sure about something, call them up on the phone and you can say, I'm a general surge path or I'm a resident, whatever. I'm not a, a dermatologist, but here's what I'm seeing. Help me sort out how this fits in with what you're seeing clinically. And I tell you what, that can save the day and really protect your patients. And I sleep a lot better every night knowing that I have a close working uh, relationship and communication with my dermatology colleagues. So first we're gonna talk about a really important uh, aspect of, of DermPath. It's, a, it's recognizing acute ischemia in the skin. There are a couple clues for this that you need to, to be on the lookout for always. Um, and if you don't know about them, they may not stand out to you as anything really special. And by the way, I'm gonna have my, my um, Twitter username and the hashtag cat virtual path here. You're welcome to screenshot any of this stuff during this talk and tweet it and tag me in the tweet. And of course include the hashtag and uh, I'll be looking at those later and uh, looking forward to seeing some great tweets. Feel free to add your own comments and uh, questions there and I'll try my best to answer them as I get to them over the weekend. So number one, here is one cutaneous clue. Look at the epidermis here. The epidermis is completely wiped out and dead in this area. And you can see that over here, it's like partially dead. How do you know it's dead? It's totally pink. The nuclei are gone. And remember, when we have necrosis, necrosis looks pink. The reason it looks pink is that as the cells die, the first thing that happens basically is the nuclear membrane starts to break down and the DNA and the nucleic acids get destroyed by endonucleases that are circulating in the body. And we don't want nucleic acids floating around our body randomly, right? So, so the nuclei break down and it's the, the DNA in the nucleus that makes the nucleus stain purple on H&E. So the nucleus dissolves right away but all of the proteins, which is what the bulk of the cytoplasm of cells is made of, they stay intact. They're, remember, proteins are, are in this, particularly in keratinocytes, they're structural proteins, keratins. They're very big, strong proteins, like big steel cables almost. That's how I think of them. It takes them a lot longer to break down. And so they're going to stick around. And of course, the proteins are what stains pink um, on the H&E stain. So when you see this wiped out pink epidermis, that's, that's really otherwise intact. There's not really any parakeratosis there. It's just like it died suddenly. That it, right away makes me worry for acute ischemia, that the blood supply was suddenly cut off to the skin and the epidermis was one of the first parts to die. It will die and start showing breakdown before the dermis does. Eventually, if the ischemia is complete enough, and is complete and lasts long enough, the dermis will also die. But here you can see the epidermis and also the follicle, the hair follicle epithelium here is beginning to die. There's also hemorrhage in the background. And in this case, the uh, diagnosis was angioinvasive fungus uh, in a patient that was completely immunocompromised. Uh, and so they have, uh, we'll talk about angioinvasive fungus later in the talk, but basically they have hemorrhage because they have no platelets and there's no inflammation because their white count was basically close to zero. So that's the reason that we have hemorrhage and this kind of just very pink and red looking slide uh, here. So epidermal necrosis without other inflammatory changes, that's a sign of acute ischemia. Number two is this. Here's the eccrine duct, the sweat duct. And down here used to be an eccrine coil. The eccrine coil is the secretory portion of the sweat gland, right? It's very sensitive to ischemia. So in, in fact, when you get ischemia in the, in the skin acutely, one of the first things to die is the eccrine coil. So finding necrosis of the eccrine coils is a really strong indication that you probably have an acute ischemic situation. And in this case, you can't really see it perfectly on this picture, but right here was a vessel and it's totally occluded by thrombus. And also on the uh, GMS and PAS thing, there was actually some fungus in this vessel and there was a lot more fungus elsewhere. But the point of this picture is to show you the eccrine coil necrosis, a very striking clue when you have it for, um, for acute ischemia. So if you see either of those two things, you need to figure out why is there ischemia in the skin? Because many of the things that cause acute ischemia in the skin are, are emergencies, things like thrombotic uh, events, um, coagulopathies, angioinvasive fungus, and a variety of others. They're things that need to be sorted out right away and that the clinical team needs to get to the bottom of and figure out what the cause is so that they can try to correct it, hopefully in time before the patient dies. So it's really important to not overlook these subtle clues. And of course, the first step before you 
even worry about anything else is look at the clinical note or call up the clinical team and find out what is the scenario clinically. So we'll talk first about one of these things, angioinvasive fungal infection, um, a very serious um, uh, problem. In these, uh, just a few high yield points, again, if you want more details, you can go into that paper, which I've cited here at the bottom uh, um, in archives uh, from 2019. So angioinvasive fungus usually occurs in immunosuppressed patients. Sometimes we see it in the setting of people that have been in a, a severe uh, motor vehicle accident or other severe trauma. Um, and it is a rapidly progressive infection that has a high mortality rate. What you see classically is fungal hyphae in the vessels, oftentimes with thrombus around them. And they also can uh, invade out of the vessels and into the dermis and associated acute ischemia like we just looked at uh, because the vessels are being blocked off by fungus and by fibrin, okay? An important note here is that fungal hyphae, you cannot reliably figure out the species just by looking at the, the histopathology slide. So on skin biopsy, you can't reliably figure out species of, of uh, hyphal fungal infections. On yeast, you sometimes can get closer to figuring out the species, but with hyphae, it's really hard. Um, and sometimes the treating physician team will pressure you to give a diagnosis of what species it is. And I will explain why you should uh, avoid doing that in a minute. So here's clinically what this can look like. This was a patient um, that had this, this violet or this uh, black, purple um, uh, necrotic plaque. And you can see it's kind of making a blister here. It's got a lot of hemorrhage. It's began, uh, began to die and come kind of this uh, dusky grayish purple color in the center. And uh, this was near a catheter site and a biopsy of this showed angioinvasive fungus. So I'm gonna show you some other pictures in this talk that are gonna have some overlapping similarities. And it's because many of the things we're gonna talk about today are things that result in ischemia, which then leads to necrosis of the skin. So they can have some similarities. When I see a purpuric, violaceous, eschar, um, necrotic ulcer, any of those things, I always start looking for where is the vessel blocked. If I see a clinical picture like this, I wanna find a cause for um, occlusion of blood vessels because that's what I'm worried about as the primary thing. And that's what the dermatology team will be worried about as well, okay? And uh, that's, uh, that's what happened here. And this patient was neutropenic. Here's a, a different patient, not the one I just showed you, but this is a, a debridement specimen from a patient with angioinvasive fungus. And this is a good example of what a skin infarct looks like. And those big necrotic ulcers, the eschars, um, that's basically what they are, they're infarcts uh, that have associated hemorrhage. You can see at both sides of this ulceration, the epidermis and the skin's relatively normal. And then look what's happening here. The skin, even from low power, the skin's starting to get pale. You can tell the color of the epidermis here is different than the normal epidermis over here. It's because it's beginning to get, to, to get necrotic. The nuclei are washing out and going away and it's becoming more pink. In the middle, the necrosis has been complete. The epidermis is totally gone and sloughed away. The dermis is bright pink and red because it's completely dead too. And underneath here, you see fat necrosis. And look at the shape of this infarct. Like other infarcts and other organs, it's a wedge shape. It has a narrow bottom, but it gets wider as it goes further away from the point of vascular blockage. So the occlusion, of course, is gonna happen down in these deeper, bigger vessels. And then you get that watershed effect where everything that branched off from those vessels is gonna lose blood flow and all of it's eventually gonna die. I'm doing hand gestures here in my office, but I realize that none of you can see them, but it still feels right, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Okay, here's a closer look, and you can see again, look at the normal epidermis over here on the right. Look over on the left, how the nuclei, a few are still left, but they're starting to go away. Again, it's so important to recognize this picture right here as this is in progress ischemia and the epidermis is dying because of it. Now, sometimes you can have that kind of necrosis happen in blister roofs from other causes. When a blister roof gets detached, like say in bolus pemphigoid, that's long standing. Sometimes the roof of the blister will die because it's detached from the dermis, which is where its blood supply is. So you can see epidermal necrosis in other things that are not ischemic, but it is important to recognize that pattern because it's really, uh, really uh, uh, critical to see that. Um, again, here there's hemorrhage because this patient was also immune suppressed. And look, here's the cause right here. You can see we'll go in closer. And here's another vessel down here. They're totally filled with fungal hyphae. Look at all those hyphae. You can see them here even on H&E. Now that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to do special stains to recognize them. And when there's clinical concern for angioinvasive fungus, and I don't see any obvious fungus on the biopsy, I'll usually still do 
uh, both PAS and GMS. I do both because sometimes the fun fungi, if, particularly if the patient has received antifungal therapies, sometimes they don't stain uh, very well with one of the stains. So I like to have both stains and I'll do deeper sections in hopes that I'll cut into an area that might have fungus. Because again, I would rather do overkill to try to find this than miss it because missing it is potentially fatal. The eccrine glands here, the coils, are not totally dead, but they don't look super happy, do they? See how they're getting vacuolated and they're starting to break down a little bit? They don't really like this ischemia. These are probably still alive because they're at the edge of the infarct where they're probably still getting a little bit of blood from that adjacent portion of the dermis. And if you're, if you're looking here, not only are the fungi in here, but look at that. There's hyphae everywhere in the background dermis. Complete invasion of the dermis, not a bit of inflammation, again, because this patient had a very, very low white count, so they weren't able to mount any immune response to the fungal infection. So when I see this really wiped out pink dermis with hemorrhage in a neutropenic or immunosuppressed patient, particularly like a bone marrow transplant patient, instantly I start worrying about fungal infection because it often is this wiped out pink look because there's no inflammation. And we're used to, as pathologists, we're used to seeing invasive fungus or other types of infectious processes with a bunch of inflammation, with abscess and granuloma, but you're not gonna have that, that stuff in a patient that's immunocompromised severely. Here's a closer look at another vessel. Again, look at the hyphae, you can see them outlined and silhouetted here because there's fibrin filling up the space in between. Um, and then here's an eccrine coil that's necrotic. And you can see there's actually fungal invasion into the eccrine coil that's dead. Here's a look actually from the same case, but way deep down in the subcutis. And you can see the fungi here look actually different. They actually have some purple color to them. So sometimes fungi are totally clear and visible on H&E. Sometimes you can see their pink, thick fungal wall. And then sometimes you can actually see some purple stuff in the middle, which I assume is kind of like the cytoplasm of the fungus. I don't really know, maybe one of my um, friends with mycology expertise can fill me in on that. But again, this is an H&E stain, the same section as the pictures I just showed you. And you can see the fungus here filling up the vessel and growing through the wall and out into the surrounding collagen. So you may say that the fungal hyphae here look kind of ribbon-like and, and kind of more like a zygomycosis uh, uh, grouping of fungus, the you know mucor, absidia, rhizopus. And if you look back here, you can see actually there's acute angle branching. And there's even, if you look closely some, um, some uh, septation in the hyphae. And in fact, this patient cultured out two different organisms. They had aspergillus and also mucor, both growing there. So I don't know for sure, but I bet this is the mucor in the previous picture is probably the aspergillus. So the only way we know that though is because they actually cultured the patient and were able to get a result. Let's look at a different case. And this is one from early in my practice. And this is a time where I learned an important lesson that I'm now gonna share with you. This is a great example of a punch biopsy at the edge of one of those violaceous SHARs like I showed you clinically earlier. They punched it right at the edge. And you can see this portion on the left here is part of the wedge of infarct. It's completely dead, pink, wiped out death of the skin. Over on the right, the skin is still alive, although probably not very happy. It looks very abnormal in here. And here at the edge of this zone of infarct was some inflammation and also at closer look, fungi. And so the fungal hyphae here, uh, this is a PIS stain, they look to me very ribbon-like, dilated, kind of obtuse, broad branching, the kind of morphology that you're supposed to see in mucor, rhizopus, and absidia. So I would al was always taught during my training uh, in fellowship to not provide a fungal species, even if the clinical team pushes you. But the clinical team in this case, the, the transplant team, they were really like, well, just give us an idea. What do you think? And I said, well, okay. I said, I don't know for sure, but I think it looks more like mucor obsidia rhizopus. You still have to culture it to be sure, but I, I really don't think it looks like aspergillus or fusarium or one of those acute angle septated fungi. Guess what this thing grew out on culture? Aspergillus niger. And actually, in retrospect, if you look, there are a few little septations here. But the thing is that this patient, they already knew that the patient probably had fungal infection. They were clinically suspicious. They had been treating the patient with systemic antifungal agents. And that can sometimes alter the morphology of the fungus. So patients that are really sick, they often are on, a, on antibiotics, antifungals, a lot of stuff because the clinical team is worried about infection. So by the time you get the biopsy, they may have been on antifungals already, and that can distort the morphology of the fungus. The other thing is that the fungal hyphae um, descriptions that we always classically learn, those are based on cultured 
uh, on uh, mycology culture dish growth of fungi, okay? The way that fung fungi grow and look in tissue on an H&E or on a, a special stain of a paraffin embedded formal and fixed tissue biopsy can be different, okay? So I urge you to be cautious with this um, and, and always guide the clinical team that they need to do cultures or in, in some cases they can do molecular studies to identify the species. And here's a great paper from the American Journal of Clinical Pathology that I really love, and I recommend you all to, to keep this tucked away in your useful files. And it basically goes through and looks at fungi and says, look, you can't reliably identify them on, on um, tissue biopsy, okay? So this is now what I cite when, when I get pushback from a clinical team about, well, come on, just give us the, the you know, just give us the uh, species of the fungus. I tell them, well, here's what the literature says. So that always helps. And here's an example, a sample report of what I would say, something like this, angioinvasive fungal infection, and I explain what it looks like, and then I put a line in here that you gotta correlate with microbial cultures or molecular analysis if they need to know the species for clinical management of the patient. And, um, uh, and I cite that, that paper. And then of course, I make sure that I, that I report the findings or discuss the findings with someone from the treating team, because again, this is an urgent diagnosis. This is a more urgent thing than melanoma or most skin cancers, okay? This is something that needs the, the team needs to know about now, today. So really important to, to keep an eye out for those. And you know, when I have to come in on a weekend to do a, a rush case, some people say, well, derm path, there's never any emergencies. But as you're gonna learn in this lecture, there are sometimes, and this is one of the more common things I come in for on a weekend um, to have to look at a rush biopsy because it can't wait till Monday. All right, here's another thing that can cause acute ischemia, thrombotic vasculopathy. And this is a kind of generic term that we use for anytime we see fibrin thrombi filling dermal blood vessels, um, this, the thrombi in vessels, we call it thrombotic vasculopathy. It leads to acute ischemia in the skin and it can have a wide variety of causes, many of which are very serious. And so this needs to also be worked up urgently uh, by the clinical team with laboratory analysis to figure out why the person has thrombi. So inherited or acquired coagulopathies, uh, diffuse, uh, uh, um, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, cryoglobulinemia is another one that a lot of times people don't think about, and it can look just like thrombi in the vessels. Um, all of those things are potentially gonna cause this pattern. So they have to clinically work this up right away to figure out what's going on. Here's an example of how this can present. It can look, um, depending on how severe it is and how many thrombi there are, the, the, it can present with various different patterns, but many times there's going to be this dusky, purpley, reddish color to the skin. And that's because as the thrombi cause ischemia, there also is hemorrhage as the, the skin begins to die. Eventually hemorrhage begins to happen as well. Um, and it can leak out into the dermis. All right, here's a, a, a picture of this um, on a biopsy. And you can see the epidermis is not totally necrotic, but it's starting to die right here. The nuclei are gone. And as it breaks down, it's starting to fall apart and lift away from the dermis and make a blister. You can also see down here, these pink fibrin thrombi in the vessels. Let's go in for a closer look at those. This is a really important distinction to make. This is a fibrin thrombus here, and so is this. And there's a tiny one right there. This is not a thrombus. This is blood engorged in a vessel, okay? A vessel that's dilated and filled with erythrocytes. When the blood has packed itself together in the vessel so tight like this, it can smudge together and look like it's filling the vessel and it can mimic a fibrin thrombus. Now, in this case, we've got both engorged vessels and fibrin thrombi, but sometimes, if you have one vessel that's just filled with blood, you can make the mistake of thinking it's a thrombus when it's actually not. So one trick, and I can't show you it here because I, um, I've just got pictures, but on your microscope, if you have a rack mounted condenser that you can flip up and down, when you're looking at higher power at the vessel, if you flip the condenser off, it'll make it look real dark through the oculars of your microscope. But one thing it helps is it helps three dimensional structures under the microscope to stand out better. It's a great way to see the, the desmosome spines between keratinocytes to help the collagen or elastic fibers stand out from one another. And it also helps the edges of erythrocytes to be more easily visualized. Whereas a fibrin thrombus is just gonna be a smudge of fibrin together, very homogenized. 
um, sometimes a little bit stringy. Here, you're gonna actually see individual outlines of erythrocytes. So that's one way to help you is by flipping the condenser off and on. Or sometimes if you don't have a condenser, you can move your finger back and forth under the light source and at the edge of where the shadow of your finger is, you'll be able to see that outline a little bit more clearly. So just one, one tip that you can try. And for those of you who take pictures for books or papers, I found actually just uh, not long ago, to my surprise, that taking pictures at higher power with the condenser flipped off can actually sometimes make much better, prettier pictures, particularly when you're taking pictures of keratinocytic lesions or the epidermis. It really makes those cells pop and stand out from one another. So there's a, there's a photography tip for you. Okay, so anyway, fibrin thrombi and hemorrhage. And also you'll note the color is a little different. With practice, you can see that uh, erythrocytes are a very bright, vivid, reddish pink, whereas you kind of have a, a little bit more dull, pale pink in fibrin thrombi usually. Here's another fibrin thrombus. It's a little bit more bright pink in color, and it's probably been present for a little bit longer. Uh, there's another one there and one there because it's got some kind of reactive vascular change around the edge of it. And again, contrast that fibrin thrombus there to actual blood down here. Okay, so let's talk about calciphylaxis. This is such an important disease to understand and recognize. Okay, some high yield points is it's a complication of end stage renal disease. The vast majority of patients with calciphylaxis have end stage renal disease, have uremia. They are in either in need of dialysis or actually on dialysis. That's the most common time where you see it. There are rare exceptions, but usually they're gonna be end stage renal disease. It is a really terrible disease. It's painful and miserable, and it has a high mortality, unfortunately. What it starts as is painful purpuric areas that eventually will progress into necrotic ulcers, or eschars is the other name for that, which is a result of this, uh, the um, accumulation of ischemia. And pathologically, what you're gonna see is calcification around small vessels, usually in the subcutaneous fat, and also scattered granular calcifications in the fat itself. You may also have various amounts of necrosis, thrombi in vessels, and sometimes in the dermis, you can have angioplasia, which I'll show you in a minute. So those are, those are uh, clues that can help you. Here's some examples uh, clinically. Here is a uh, purpuric, very, again, it's very painful, purpuric um, patches and plaques on this patient in areas it's beginning to progress into hemorrhagic blisters. And I would like to point out one thing. This is a darker skin patient. In patients with dark skin types, um, brown or black skin is the way that I generically explain it to my med students, or Fitzpatrick, four, five, whatever. The darker skin types, uh, erythema and violaceous areas look different, okay, than on light skin. On light skin, it's easier to see pink and red. On dark skin, without practice, pink and red can really uh, be a lot more subtle and hard to pick up on. And so it's really important, and I try to always, when I teach my students, um, and show clinical dermatology pictures. I like to show them dark skin types and light skin types because especially for non-tumor diseases, dermatoses and inflammatory non-neoplastic derm processes, they look different on dark skin than on light skin. And so it's a really important time to recognize the different ways that cutaneous disease present um, in different skin types, okay? This is a much more severe advanced case where the skin has totally broken down and turned into this black, necrotic, awful ulcer um, it's a really, really terrible disease. Now, here's the classic finding. This little vessel here, this is a little endothelial cell, a couple red cells. This little vessel, it's got a ring of calcium around it. So usually it's the small vessels in the subcutis that are the most likely to show this, and they're gonna have calcium in the vessel wall. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes those vessels can be kind of sparse, and in some cases you won't see them really well. So you gotta learn the other patterns that you can see, okay? One of those is these granular kind of chunky, broken up calcium deposits in between the subcutaneous fat adipocytes, all right? Sometimes they're big chunks, sometimes they're tiny little chunks. They're often fragmented and broken like this. So that's another thing that you'll see. Here's another example, fragmented calcifications, and then here's a small vessel with calcium deposited in the wall of the vessel. Another case. This is from a really, really florid case. In fact, one of the most dramatic florid examples of calciphylaxis I've ever seen. It does not always look this dramatic. And that's why it's really important to understand this because sometimes you really have to hunt to find those calcifications. So stop looking at these big chunky ones for a minute and look at these. Those are calcifications too. Look at those out there and down here. 
you have to learn to recognize the really subtle calcifications because sometimes that's all you're going to have. Here's an example, again, where a vessel's got complete encasement by calcium, but look at this fine powdery calcium that's depositing out here around it. If you didn't have this vessel, you might really struggle to know if that's really calcium or not. Like in this case right here. I mean, here's some fat necrosis over here. Is this really calcification or are, are these fragments of, of broken down white blood cell nuclei, right? Is this, is this karyorectic debris? It can be really hard to tell. Up here, you have a small thrombosed blood vessel, again, with little speckles of calcium in the wall. So if you have a case where this is all that you have, the clinical settings concerning for calciphylaxis, but you only find this little bit of black or a dark purple to black little powder in there, you can try um, uh, doing a von Kassa stain, which will stain um, these little fragments and help highlight them. Um, it sometimes works. I also do, if I don't find obvious features, I usually do deeper levels, cutting into the, plot, the block deeper, because again, sometimes the findings are gonna be focal in calciphylaxis. And the most important thing is that you need to have a biopsy that samples the subcutis. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes the team will do a punch biopsy or, or gosh, even worse, a shave. And that's not going to show you much because the dermis um, has a variety of nonspecific changes, but oftentimes doesn't have any calcium deposition or very minimal calcium in the dermis. The subcutis is where the money is. So what I tell my dermatology um, uh, team when they're thinking about calciphylaxis is the best thing is to have an ellipse, a skin ellipse or a wedge excision, which goes all the way down into the subcutis that allows us to get a large amount of subcutis to sample. Sometimes that's not always feasible. And when it's not, the alternative possibility for this and also for other things where you need to sample the subcutis like paniculitis, for example, you can do a telescoping punch or a double punch biopsy. And that's where the dermatologist will take the punch tool, punch out a plug of dermis, snip it off and put it in the bottle, and then take that same tool and go back into the same punch biopsy hole, down in and push into the fat, punch out a plug of adipose tissue and put that into the container. And for those of you, I've invited, I've invited my derm residents um, and uh, some others to listen in. For those of you out there who are dermatologists, it's important if you do that, please put on the requisition sheet or into the computer entry, two pieces of tissue in the bottle. Because sometimes in the pathology gross lab, we're used to getting a punch biopsy by itself in a bottle. And that little piece of clear fat floating around or yellowish clear fat floating around might get lost or might get stuck to the lid of the biopsy bottle. And that would be a, a, you know, a real loss to miss out on that piece of tissue that may have the best diagnostic information. So if you're putting an extra piece of tissue in, it really helps us um, to, uh, to make sure that we double check to make sure that we get that tissue um, embedded uh, properly. All right. Here's another example where you have more abundant fat necrosis, even with some neutrophils. There are other forms of uh, paniculitis that could begin to produce a pattern like this, like maybe alpha-1 antitrypsin paniculitis or um, pancreatic fat necrosis, although it usually looks a little different, a little bit more esoteric stuff that's outside the scope of today's talk. But this pattern by itself is not specific, but if you show me this and say it's from a big black necrotic ulcer in an end-stage renal disease patient, I'm gonna be really worried about calciphylaxis and I'm gonna hunt desperately to find calcium. And if I don't find any, I'm still gonna describe the changes I see and tell them to closely follow the patient and maybe consider doing another biopsy if they're still worried about calciphylaxis. I really want them to stay on it because it's such a serious disease. Now, this is a really cool pearl that's not present in all cases, but when you see it, it can be very helpful. Here's a big, big ulcer that's been uh, removed uh, for part of a debridement. And uh, look over here away from the ulcer at this stuff. These in the deep dermis here, we have this really robust proliferation of blood vessels. These clustered lobules of vessels that are sprouting up in the dermis. What this is, this is a dermal angioplasia or is basically angioneogenesis, new vessel formation. And the way I think of it is that in calciphylaxis, as the calcium deposits build up in the vessels and throm thrombi start to develop, you begin to get ischemia that eventually causes the skin to die. But I feel like that process doesn't happen overnight, like say in angioinvasive fungus. I believe that it must slowly begin to build up over time and then eventually gets to a point that it's so severe that the skin does die and break down. In that chronic buildup of ischemia, the response that the dermis makes is that it starts growing new blood vessels to try to supply more blood flow and more oxygenation to the skin. So this clustered lobular proliferation of vessels, kind of akin to what you would see in 
some areas of granulation tissue maybe, that's really helpful. If I see that in an ulcer, and again, the patient has end-stage renal disease, I'm gonna bring up, this is a really worrisome finding for calciphylaxis. Even if I don't see underlying calci calcifications, I'm gonna tell the clinical team, please go back and biopsy deeper because this is a worrisome feature that's seen sometimes over top in the dermis, over top of calciphylaxis. The other time where you can see this, again, you can see it in the setting of maybe a, a chronic ulcer or granulation tissue, but you can also see it in the dermis, particularly in the lower legs, in patients that have chronic arterial insufficiency. They have chronic low blood flow, like from peripheral vascular disease, and over time, the dermis begins to get more vascularity. It begins to get fibrotic and an increase in spindled fibroblasts in the dermis. So when I see that increased kind of the word I use for it is busy. The dermis has got more stuff going on than usual, more vessels, more fibroblasts, more collagen. When I see that, particularly in the lower leg, that's another thing I keep in mind is, is chronic vascular insufficiency. And I can recommend the clinical team to, to get a Doppler ultrasound of the patient to see how their blood flow is. Um, so it's an important clue to recognize. And again, look, everything we're talking about today, none of it's tumor, which is I think what makes a lot of derm path harder to general pathologists because there's so much in it that is not tumor, not neoplastic, and there's a lot of clinical understanding that has to happen. But you know what? You don't have to know all the fancy Latin names in dermatology to be able to help out, to be able to just give the pattern of disease, the pattern of what you're seeing, and to call up the derm and say, I'm not really sure what this means. Here's what I'm seeing. I can send it out for a consult, but I wanted to give you this preliminary info. The dermatologists have a lot of skill in dermatopathology. It's a big, like it's like I think a third of their board examination. So our derm residents do months of derm path rotation during their residency. So they're actually really pretty good at derm path. And a lot of times if you tell them what you're seeing, they can help work that out with you and put together what might be going on um, given the clinical setting. So that teamwork is crucial. Here's just a closer look at the angio. Um, the angioplasia here. All right, let's change gears to something else that can also cause a serious skin disease, but is not related to ischemia. This is Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis spectrum, SJS-TEN spectrum. And the reason that we call it a spectrum is because SJS and TEN, basically I think of them as the same thing from an etiology level. It's the same cause. It's just a matter of severity, how much of the body surface area is covered and, and sloughing and necrosing, and that's how it's classified. So if it's less than 10% of the body surface area, then it gets classified as Stevens-Johnson syndrome. If it's greater than 30%, then it's classified as toxic epidermal necrolysis. If it's in between there, then it's like overlap. So I just when I talk about this in my pathology reports, I put it as SJS slash TEN spectrum, and I leave it up to the dermatology to te team to decide how to classify it. And also sometimes the amount of body surface area involved changes rapidly over time. It may be very different tomorrow than it is today. So at its heart, what this is, is a form of vacuolar interface dermatitis that's so severe that it leads to epidermal necrosis and the skin and also the mucosa, particularly the oral mucosa, the lips and inside the mouth, begin to slough off and kind of get loose and fall off the body. And I underlined mucosa here because it's such an important clinical clue. SJS TEN, the majority of the time they will have mouth involvement. So if I don't get that information from the clinical team and someone's thinking about SJS TEN, the first thing I'm gonna ask my dermatologists are, it, it is, does the patient have mouth involvement? Is there mucosal involvement? Because it's usually gonna be present, okay, in SJSTEN. The majority of the times this is caused by some sort of drug. Antibiotics are common offenders, but a variety of other medi medications can lead to SJSTEN. And I use this as an example when I'm teaching my med students that, you know, we think sometimes of antibiotics or even NSAIDs, you know, like, like ibuprofen and stuff as these relatively harmless drugs. But every once in a while, it may be rare, but every once in a while you can have really severe side effects even from common over-the-counter medications. And it's important to keep that in mind when we are, you know, when when we're thinking about taking medications or giving medi medications that sometimes rare bad side effects happen even with otherwise, you know, usually benign drugs. All right. The important things here to keep in mind are that microscopically to the pathologist SJSTEN can look like erythema multiforme or a variety of other vacuolar interface dermatitis, okay? There are some subtle clues that can help us, but really to, we cannot tell 
SJSTEN apart from erythema multiforme on microscopic findings alone, okay? You have to have, must, essential, you must have the clinical information to make it fit, okay? And on the flip side of that, there is a disease that can mimic SJSTEN, and that's staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. And in staph scalded skin, clinically, they can have sloughing of the skin, you can have some lip involvement, but under, on a biopsy, the um, reason for the blistering is different and it's not gonna have vacuolar interface and I'll show you in a second. So, so biopsy there can be very easy way to tell these two apart. So here's an example of a patient with TEN and you can see that, again, it's a dark skin patient, so the erythema doesn't really stand out here. You can see there's modeling of the pigment, but look at this area here where it's getting loose. Here's a closer view. All of this skin, it may not look that bad at first, but if you touched it with your finger, it would slip and slough right off and slide off of this patient. And that's called the Nikolsky sign. And that's a sign that all of the epidermis is breaking down here. And that's why it looks loose and wrinkly. This just hasn't fallen off yet, but it will very soon. So this is a picture before it has sloughed off and ulcerated. But it's just, it gives you an idea of how the, the skin is getting loose and wrinkly because it's lost its connection with the dermis. The epidermis is not, is losing its connection to the underlying dermis. And so it's just wrinkling up and sliding away. It's really terrible. These patients, when they get such extensive, when this eventually ulcerates, they're gonna basically have these open, weeping, shallow ulcers all over their body. And the problem with that is, is that's a lot like having severe burns, right? Where the epidermis is gone, you're leaking out fluid, so you can have fluid and electrolyte problems. And you also are totally exposed to all of the environmental bacteria and pathogens that could potentially enter the body without the protection of the epidermis. So because of that, these patients often get treated in the burn unit, just like they would if they had severe burns. So this is one of those times, again, where you might get called in on a weekend or at night or something to look at a biopsy of this. Now, in my practice, we actually don't do frozen sections for these. We've worked out a system with our laboratory and the clinical team where when we have an urgent case, usually we will have the histotech come in and do a rapid processing of the biopsy, and then we can read it on a, a regular paraffin section rather than a frozen. Some people are able to get really pristine results on frozen. In my experience, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a toss up. Sometimes you really can sacrifice quality doing a frozen section. And if, if you're able to spend a few extra hours of waiting to get a, a rapid process permanent section, that can be good enough. It gives you a better quality and usually is rapid enough that the clinical team gets the info it needs in a timely manner. So you have to work that out with your clinical team, but that was an implementation that we made in our practice uh, some years ago, and it's worked out really well in our experience so far. Here's uh, the look at the oral mucosal involvement. The lips and the mouth is really terrible. So there's hemorrhage, ulceration, uh, very classic to have oral mucosal involvement in the, this disease. Now, this is a review for those of you who may not have looked at, at inflammatory derm path for a while, but this is a classic example of vacuolar interface ul um, alteration. What you're gonna see is lymphocytes, the little dark purple guys, they're basically attacking the basal layer of the epidermis and they're killing, inducing death or apoptosis of keratinocytes. So sometimes people call these apoptotic keratinocytes or not, it's not correct, but sometimes they'll call them necrotic keratinocytes or dyskeratotic keratinocytes, or sometimes people will say savat bodies and cytoid bodies. There's all these different names for the same thing. Dead keratinocytes at the basal layer. So that's one thing, these bright pink keratinocytes Number two, you're gonna get these white vacuoles. This is the vacuolar part of vacuolar interface alteration. And we call it interface because it's at the interface of the epidermis and the dermis, okay? So there'll be lymphocytes, white vacuoles, dying keratinocytes in varying number along the basal layer of the epidermis. Eventually, pigment, melanin pigment from the basal keratinocytes will drop out as those keratinocytes die. You can see that happening here, right? That guy died. And that keratin is starting, I'm sorry, the melanin is starting to fall down into the dermis, okay? And this process here, we can tell has happened relatively rapidly. How do we know? Look at the top part of the epidermis. It just looks like normal skin. There's basket weave, stratum corneum, totally normal looking spinous layer keratinocytes. This happened probably in a day or two, a couple of days. This happened so fast that the rest of the epidermis hasn't had time to even show any response or any sort of side effect of this. And that's often the case in in SJSTEN and other diseases. Now, 
and the other thing I was going to point out is one kind of clue to interface dermatitis is when you're having trouble drawing a line between the epidermis and the dermis, you might be dealing with interface dermatitis because that's what happens is the epidermal dermal junction or the interface gets kind of blurry as it starts falling apart from the vacuolar change and the lymphocytes, okay? So recognizing these dying keratinocytes and the vacuoles, very, very important. This case, it turns out, it was not actually SJSTEN. This case was erythema multiforme, but I guarantee you, you could have this exact same pattern in SJSTEN. The difference is where the biopsy is done and how long the lesion has been present. If you get a newly, uh, newly developed area in SJSTEN that hasn't blistered or sloughed off yet, it may show stuff just like this. But if you wait a day or so to biopsy, then it may have this finding complete epidermal necrosis. Now, this is the classic thing that we all talk about and learn about when we talk about SJSTEN, is that you should have full thickness necrosis of the epidermis. And yes, classically you will, but it depends again on where the biopsy is done and how and when the biopsy is done, okay? Now, we have a different problem in this, this picture here. Here we can see that the epidermis is dead. It's all wiped out in pink, right? Maybe a couple nuclei are retained. You can tell that this happened rapidly. Look at that basket weave stratum cornea. This epidermis was alive a day or two ago and then suddenly died. So you can get this same kind of pattern of necrosis in ischemic change, right? And a, 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 an acute ischemic blister could look just like this. How on earth do we know if this is SJSTEN versus something else? Oh, you know what else could cause this? Freezing injury. If you freeze skin or if you burn it, the epidermis can wipe out just like this and get this very pinked, ghosted look to it and die suddenly, okay? So there's a variety of things that can cause epidermal necrosis like this. And here, we can't really tell. We can tell that the skin's lifted off. There may be a couple keratinocytes retained at the basal layer there. But the key, as with many blistering processes, is the blister roof doesn't give you that much information. You have to see the periphery of the blister where the intact residual epidermis is to figure out what the primary underlying cause of the blister is or to try to figure it out. And then here's it, what it would look like. Here's the area of complete full thickness necrosis. But as you get over here in the intact epidermis, you can see there's vacuolar change and dying keratinocytes. So this is a vacuolar interface dermatitis with full thickness necrosis. In the clinical setting, this is SJSTEN. I'll also point out that sometimes erythema multiforme can have bolus blister-like change. And when it does, if you biopsy the middle of one of those targetoid lesions, guess what you'll see? Full thickness necrosis. So it goes both ways. You can have really subtle SJSTEN that looks just like erythema multiforme, but you can also have really, really robust erythema multiforme that has necrosis just like SJSTEN. And there are a variety of other interface dermatoses that can get into this same um, differential uh, sometimes, but usually it's clinically more evident what they're dealing with in those cases. Now, let's talk just briefly about staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. If you remember what this is, is that basically the patient has a staph infection somewhere in their body, like in the nasopharynx, for example, and the staph organism makes an exfoliative toxin, a toxin that damages the connection between keratinocytes, and that toxin circulates through the whole body and causes skin sloughing elsewhere in the body. So there's no bacteria actually here in the skin. The bacterial infection is somewhere else, like in the nasopharynx or, or elsewhere in the body. But the toxin is what's circulating. So you're not gonna see bacteria on a skin biopsy of staph scalded skin. If you see bacteria in a skin lesion, then you're actually thinking of something like impetigo, which is gonna clinically be very different than this, okay? So this, this is more often in kids, um, and you often get the sloughing in the flexural sites, uh, or sites of trauma, you get lip crusting and fissuring, lip involvement. So you could see how this bears some similarity to SJSTEN. But of course, SJSTEN is very severe, it can be fatal, whereas this is much more easily treated by giving antibiotic therapy uh, to stop the staph organisms. And these patients, I think, usually do pretty well. Now, here's what you're gonna see microscopically. It may look similar to SJSTEN clinically, but it doesn't look at all like it microscopically. Here's the cause of the skin sloughing and blistering the stratum corneum is lifting away from the underlying um, epidermis. And why that's happening is that the keratinocytes in the superior spinous layer or at the granular layer, they're breaking apart from one another because that exfoliative toxin is damaging those desmosome connections that hold the keratinocytes together with one another. 
it's similar to the kind of detachment that you'd see in pemphigus foliaceus, for example, where instead of it being a toxin causing it, it's an antibody against the desmoglians that are in those desmosomes that's breaking them down. But it can give you this similar pattern of superficial epidermal um, detachment due to acantholysis. That's what we call it when keratinocytes lose connection with each other and fall apart. That's called acantholysis. It means lysis of the acanthotic, the, the spiny layer of the epidermis. Now look at this biopsy closer. You don't see any interface change here. So you're not gonna see the vacuolar interface in dying keratinocytes that typify SJSTEN. But you might say, well, there's no blister here though. Or is there? Look what's happening at the top. Sometimes when it's gone, you don't realize that the stratum corneum is totally missing. Your eye doesn't recognize because we're used to seeing a blister with a bottom and a top to it. And sometimes if the top has peeled totally away, particularly on these superficial, what we call subcorneal blistering processes like this one, you just, your eye doesn't even notice it. Your mind just kind of ignores the fact that there's not a stratum corneum there. And if you look elsewhere on the slide, if you're lucky, you may actually find that blister roof like this. This is the sloughed off surface, the stratum corneum with a bit of the stratum granulosum hanging on for dear life in there. And it's slipped away and totally detached from the underlying um, rest, the remainder of the epidermis. So sometimes, even if you don't have the skin, you just have this, I can look at this and say, this would fit for staph scalded skin, but this would not fit for SJSTEN. If we look closer, you can see the acantholysis. These are actually granular layer keratinocytes. You can tell because they've got the purple keratohyaline granules. And usually the acantholysis tends to happen right around the granular layer, where the granular layer you know, is what joins the stratum corneum to the stratum spinosum in the epidermis. Um, and if you need a refresher on the normal uh, skin histology, I've got a video on my YouTube channel that's like an hour and 20 minutes of all that you could ever want to know about skin histology uh, from the dermatopathologist perspective. So this acantholysis here is an important thing to recognize, and that's what's caused the blister roof to lift off here. Okay, so finally, one last disease before we finish up, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And this is pyoderma gangrenosum sometimes abbreviated as PG. Now it's important to remember that unfortunately abbreviations are a real problem in medicine because they're even in the field of dermatology, there are two diseases abbreviated as PG. The other one is pyogenic granuloma, also known as lobular capillary hemangioma. And it's gonna be a little ulcerated red nodule that's fleshy and that's made of a lot of blood vessels, totally unrelated to pyoderma gangrenosum. So just to point that out, and I, I still have to catch myself even after eight years in practice as a dermatopathologist, it, sometimes I, I get tripped up over the words and I have to stop and think before I say it to make sure I say pyoderma gangrenosum when I'm talking about this disease. Okay, maybe I'm the only one that has that problem, but if you're out there and have that problem, you're, you're in company with me at least. Here's the high yield points. It's technically classified as a neutrophilic dermatosis because neutrophils kind of drive the process. And what happens is the patients get these rapidly progressing ulcers that can be very severe, very disfiguring and terrible. Sometimes they can go away and then come back later. It can really be a long-term, real problematic disease. 50% or so of the patients have an underlying systemic disorder of some sort that is going on and the pyoderma gangrenosum is happening as a kind of secondary phenomenon to their internal systemic disorder. The most common one is inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, okay? The reason that PG is so important to understand is that it is very commonly misdiagnosed clinically, and when it is, it can have devastating results. These often look like chronic ulcers. Uh, sometimes they get mistaken for necrotizing fasciitis, and there's an attempt to surgically debreed them. The bad news is, is that if, when you do surgery on these ulcers, they have a tendency to recur with even more vengeance than before. They get worse, and that's called the pathergy effect, where trauma, including surgical manipulation, can lead the process to break down the skin even more and expand the ulcerations, and it's really terrible. So that's why it's important to recognize this and try to get a diagnosis when we can, because it can help spare the patient from getting surgical debridement, which could be disastrous, okay? And one thing I'll point out here is it's so important to make sure an actual dermatologist sees the patient. And I'm not saying that because I don't have respect for my general surgery colleagues or anyone else, but this is an uncommon disease and it's not on many people's radar, but dermatologists have seen it and they recognize that it has several clues clinically. And I feel like dermatologists often will walk in the room and see the ulcer and say, oh, this looks classic for pyoderma gangrenosum. They get a good feel for what it looks like and they can really help 
in sorting out things, especially if the patient's being covered by the general surgery service. Sometimes I'll, I'll tell the surgeons, hey, this could be really helpful to have a derm see this patient too, and then work together as a team to figure it out. Because again, the difference is neck fascia, they're gonna do surgical debridement and they're gonna give antibiotics. And for pyoderma, they're gonna actually do the opposite. They're gonna not do surgery and they're gonna give steroids or some other immunosuppressing drug, which is the last thing you'd wanna do if it was an infection. So this is why it's a real problem. Unfortunately, it's also a problem for the, us as pathologists. Classically, the way it's described is that you'll have a sheet of neutrophils filling the dermis under the ulcer. But in reality, in my experience and in some published studies, many of the cases will actually show just nonspecific ulcer changes without very many neutrophils. It depends a lot on the age of the, the lesion. And in my practice, many times once the patient comes in and gets biopsied, they are coming in because they've had a chronic non-healing ulcer. So the ulcer's been there for a while, okay? And so I find that oftentimes these long-standing ulcers, they really don't have much of the neutrophils anymore, and they look just like a lot of other chronic non-specific ulcers. The main thing is that infection needs to be excluded, either both, either by special stains pathologically, by um, culture clinically, or a variety of those. And once infection has been excluded as best we can, if they, the dermatologist thinks it's PG, then the next step would be to give the patient a trial of immunosuppressive therapy and follow them very closely. And in cases where we can't figure it out for sure, that's what I usually recommend to my clinical team is do everything we can to rule out infection and then give them steroids, systemic steroids or something else and watch them really closely. If it starts getting better, that's a good sign. If it gets worse, then biopsy it again and check it again for infection. All right, here's what it looks like um, clinically. You get these ulcers. Sometimes they kind of have this, I think, fenestrated appearance is the word that some people use. It's kind of multiple punched out holes that start to connect together. They often have the rolled kind of undermined border. And I'll show you what that means uh, under the microscope in a minute. Uh, and I've also seen some cases that had surface colonization by fungus or bacteria on the very top layer of fibrin, but none down in the dermis. And it's important to recognize a layer of fungus or bacteria on the very top of a chronic ulcer doesn't necessarily mean that fungus or bacteria are causing the ulcer. In fact, if I only see it up at the very surface and not in the dermis at all, that makes me think probably it's not infectious. There may still be some role for antimicrobial therapy there um, to make sure, that, but I kind of think of it as colonization. You know, you've got an ulcer like this covered in fiber and guess what, fungus, bacteria, everything's gonna love to grow on that. So I've seen that a few times actually in cases of pyoderma gangrenosum that had secondary colonization with microorganisms on the very top, but not in the dermis or subcutis. Microscopically, here's an example from our paper of the classic neutrophil rich pattern that you're supposed to see, okay? But I can tell you what, I had to search through my files to find just one good example of that. Most of the cases that we've seen that clinically looked and behaved just like pyoderma gangrenosum did not have this pattern at the point where I saw their biopsy. But here's what the classic is. Tons of neutrophils filling the dermis, looks like an abscess, right? And that's why you have to exclude infection. When you see this, you do gram stain and PAS, GMS, maybe fight stain even to rule out um, AFB. Um, the neutrophils are here underneath the ulcer, but if you biopsy at the edge of the ulcer, which I highly recommend when, they're, when there's a clinical concern for pyoderma gangrenosum, the biopsy ideally should be a wedge or an ellipse, but if it can't be, then a big punch that uh, encompasses the edge, the border of the ulcer, to show me part of the ulcer and part of the edge. Now that's a little different than what I would want in say angioinvasive fungus or thrombotic vasculopathy. I want them to give me a biopsy right from the middle, from the ugliest, most necrotic area, because that's where I'm most likely to find you know, calcification, thrombi, angioinvasive fungus. Here, I don't wanna see that, I wanna see the edge, okay? So I can see if the neutrophils or the, the ulcer uh, contents undermine, that means they go under the epidermis adjacent to the ulcer, that undermining is what gives the kind of rolled border appearance clinically, and it's a very characteristic feature of pyoderma gangrenosum, and so I find that it can be helpful to find this undermining effect of where the infiltrate goes out to the edge under the normal epidermis adjacent to the ulcer. So if I just have a biopsy from the middle of the ulcer, it's not gonna tell me very much usually. Now, here's a great example a great example for us to learn from, but unfortunately really bad for the patient. In this case, this patient's surgeon thought that this was an ulcer that needed debrided, 
But it turns out that once there was more investigation, the patient had inflammatory bowel disease, and this was classic clinically for pyoderma gangrenosum. The surgeon just wasn't familiar with the disease in that case. And this was sent to me long ago as a consult, and I never found out whether the patient had pathology effect, but this big excision was done as a debridement. But why it's helpful for us here for learning today is two things. Number one, you can beautifully see the rolled border and the undermining at the edge of the ulcer border. That's number one. And number two, look in here, we have edema, reactive vessels, inflammation, and a thick fibrin, uh, you know, a layer of fibrin crust on the surface of the ulcer. But let's go down for a closer look. Not too many neutrophils there, are there? I mean, this looks like granulation tissue. You could see this in, in, in any old ulcer that's been around or, or in a biopsy site or a post-surgical changes. You could see this reactive granulation tissue look anywhere. Yeah, there may be a few scattered neutrophils here, but there were other areas from this case that just had none, really. The more prominent inflammatory cells in this case actually are plasma cells and lymphocytes. But again, clinically, this person had classic features of pyoderma gangrenosum and had a known history of inflammatory bowel disease, which, you know, all of that fits together perfectly for this being PG. Um, but so this is a great example to me because it was a case that was as good as you could get confirmed clinically PG and it didn't have very many neutrophils. So it's a good take home lesson. So as a pathologist, how do you deal with this when you get one of these specimens and the derm team wants to know if it's PG or not, and it doesn't have specific features of PG. So here's what I say in these cases. I say ulcer with granulation tissue, and I put that there's no classic features of PG, i.e. sheets of neutrophils, but I mentioned that some cases of PG can be nonspecific and look just like a regular um, ulcer. And um, if they, now here I didn't say this comment, obviously, because this was obvious PG, but if they haven't given me the edge of the ulcer, I'll tell them that they should follow the patient and then repeat a biopsy to get the border of the ulcer, and that might be helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, these are these chronic ulcers are a real frustration for everyone, okay? They're a frustration for the patient because it's miserable to have a big non-healing ulcer on your body. It's a terrible thing to go through. You know, I had a chronic infection of my thumbnail, a perinicchia. This is a too much information time now where I'm going to tell you my medical history. Just this tiny little ulcerated thing. It was painful. It was draining. It was miserable. And I thought, gosh, this is this tiny thing. And there are people out there who have these huge non-healing ulcers. That must be a real problem. And, and I actually ended up having part of my thumbnail removed by one of my dermatology colleagues and it fixed the problem. And if you want, you can go watch a video of that, my thumbnail getting removed. It's pretty disturbing, I'll warn you now. It's on my YouTube channel. So um, I, I'll use my own health to teach other people too. If I'm gonna use my cases, I better use my own uh, too. So in any case, um, I can't remember my point before that digression. Oh yeah, this is a terrible problem because people with chronic ulcers are miserable. The dermatologists and the surgeons and the treating doctors they're frustrated because they're trying everything to fix this and they can't get the ulcer to heal. And then we as pathologists are frustrated because what we're seeing under the microscope is, yeah, it's non-healing ulcer. But sometimes by just looking at the biopsy of the ulcer and saying, no, there's no infection that I can see in this biopsy. Um, there's no angioinvasive fungus. There's no thrombotic vasculopathy. By ruling out some of those other causes of ulcer or, or squamous cell carcinoma sometimes causes chronic ulcers. To be able to say, no, there's no tumor. No, there's, there's no um, occlusive vascular thrombotic changes. No, I don't see granulomas I, and the bug stains, the infectious stains are normal. That can sometimes help by ruling out those other causes and help the team get closer to making a diagnosis. So, so even when you sign it out that way, it's not very satisfying for us as a pathologist, but know that you, you are playing a role in helping uh, get the team closer, hopefully to solving the problem for the patient. But I have to admit, when I see these biopsies, I'm like, oh man, because I know that likely I'm not gonna be able to offer them a ton of useful information. So if you struggle with them, so do I. And I think my friends that that brings us to the end of our hour, I think hour and five minutes maybe, and the end of our talk. I would be happy to take any questions now. And thank you all so much for joining from around the world. It's really warms my heart because I, I love having friends all over the world in pathology who I know through Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and YouTube. And many of you have gotten to meet in real life, face to face at meetings. And I can't wait until the day when we are done with this pandemic and I can travel again and come to your country or city and get to meet all of you and get to know you in real life. So thank you for tuning in and thank you for being part of the global pathology community. Um, it really has made my day to be here.
Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Gardner. And we do have a lot of questions stored up for you. So we're going to okay. do our normal extension time. We'll get through as many as we can. And I'm going to start with just a whole series of how do you differentiate, how do you differentiate, how do you differentiate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first one, how do you differentiate, I'm going to say this wrong, pemphigus folicaeus from SSSS? So pemphigus foliaceus um, and uh, staph scalded skin can look essentially identical, um, actually. I think that those two are actually relatively close mimics. Um, and uh, the, they usually are both gonna have acantholysis right there below the stratum corneum, which gives you a, a subcorneal blister. And they're uh, gonna usually not have much inflammation. There are some exceptions, but usually they're relatively low inflammation. So the most important thing on that is gonna be getting direct immunofluorescence. So a separate biopsy has to be done and submitted in Michelle media or some other non-formal end media like saline, if you don't let it sit very long, um, there's a variety of other things, but anyway, and then it, it's exam, it's frozen and examined with antibodies for um, immunoglobulin G and complement C3, and you'll find that net-like pattern around the keratinocytes. Uh, there are also some, I think, I think there's also um, indirect immunofluorescence on the patient's serum, and probably there are lysis studies for P. foliaceous. Clinically also, P. foliaceous is gonna be a bit different. Um, I don't remember ever seeing P. foliaceous in a kid, but it's a relatively rare disease. So it may just be that I've not seen it before, but all the P. foliaceous that I've seen has been in adults. But I think that clinically it's gonna be a little bit of a different scenario. Staph scalded skin is more of a rapid onset usually that comes right alongside the, the staph infection. P. foliaceous often is kind of going to be these shallow, crusty ulcerations, often on the trunk, and they're going to have been present for some time, often, oftentimes. Again, though, this, you know, when it first shows up, it may be harder to tell. But a lot of times dermatologists are going to have a good idea. But direct immunofluorescence is really, I think, the gold standard to differentiate those. All right. Next one. Differentiating between ischemia and burns as both cause necrotic epidermis. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, ischemia and burn, the epidermis change can look identical. And cryotherapy can do the same. If you take a, a liquid nitrogen freeze gun and you spray a spot on my skin, and then tomorrow you punch biopsy, guess what? It's going to show you a wiped out dead epidermis, probably that's starting to blister, and you wouldn't ever be able to know. So the real key is finding the thrombi in the vessels, okay? So unless the burn is really severe, like where it started to kind of char the skin, I don't usually think of having lots of thrombi in vessels, unless again, it's a real severe burn. Um, and then, so finding the, th the, the thrombi in vessels is one thing. And number two, the clinical history. And this, I know we say this a lot in DermPath, but it really, really is important, particularly in these non-tumor situations, knowing what happened. And there are times where the clinical information is either not provided to us by the treating doctor, or where the patient has not revealed the actual information to the treating doctor. So there've been times where I've seen something microscopically, I've gone back to the dermatologist and I've asked and said, hey, could this patient have had freezing exposure or, or something else and burn, whatever, or are they putting something on this topically? And when they go back and ask the patient, the patient's like, oh, well, yeah, I did try to treat it with a topical therapy I read about on Facebook, or I did go to someone the other day and they froze it, but then it started swelling, so I came in. So the patients don't always whether intentionally or unintentionally, they don't always disclose the entire story up front. So that's why sometimes picking up the phone and getting that extra information can really solve the problem for you. I cannot tell you how often looking at a clinical photograph, sometimes just one clinical photograph that gives me a real clear idea of how serious a problem is compared to what the description was, or picking up the phone and talking to my clinical colleague I, that has saved me from legal trouble and from harming patients multiple times, I think, in my eight years of practice. It takes a little bit of extra effort, but it is so worth it, and it's the way that we can do the best possible job of caring for our patients. All right, I'm gonna keep throwing these at you. We have a lot of them. I'll um, go until my voice runs out. Keep them okay. coming. <laughs> How to differentiate actinomycosis from fungus. Mm. So I actually have a, a video I just released recently of actinomycotic mycetoma. And so you can go look at that if you want an example, but actinomyces and deep fungal infection, like a fungal ball, a mycetoma in the, in the dermis, they can look similar because they make a ball of organisms that often get surrounded by that beautiful splendor hopley phenomenon, that antigen antibody complex that coats the, the ball of organism. But when you look closer, 
you're gonna see actinomyces is thin filamentous bacteria, thread-like, really, really thin. They're so thin that you just can't usually see the individual organisms because they're so meshed up with each other. But the um, fungal hyphae are much thicker, okay? Fungal hyphae are thick, and so you should you should be able to see, particularly if you look towards the edge of one of the fungus balls, actual like tubes of, of hyphae. To me, that's one thing that I can use to recognize hyphae is that either on longitudinal section or cross section, you've got a, a wall that's made of the fungal wall, but then it gets kind of hollow in the middle usually. So it gives you this kind of pipe or tube shape and that can help. The other thing is doing a GMS or a PAS stain will really help the fungal hyphae stand out, but are not gonna light up um, an actinomycotic mycetoma. So I feel like on H&E, you usually can solve it, but if you need help, PAS and GMS can help you um, sort that out. All right. I have a few people asking about sweet and PG. And here's one comment. I'm not quite sure how to interpret this. Can PG lack overlying ulcer mimicking sweet? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, in our paper, we talk about sweet syndrome, um, which is um, febrile uh, neutrophilic dermatosis. And it's classically going to have sheets of neutrophils. So it can look very similar to what classic pyoderma gangrenosum is supposed to look like. From my reading, although in practice I've not experienced this, really early pyoderma gangrenosum, when it first starts, if you get a biopsy of it, it's like often a it's a, a collection of neutrophils, sometimes that forms near a hair follicle, almost like a folliculitis kind of look in some papers. And then it expands and then breaks down into an ulcer. So, um, so sweets can give you a bunch of neutrophils in the dermis. Usually alongside that, you have a ton of papillary dermal edema in sweet syndrome. I find that really helpful to have neutrophils with a bunch of edema. The other thing is that clinically, sweet syndrome is gonna look very different from pyoderma gangrenosum most of the time. If pyoderma is going to look like this big ulcers I showed you, sweet syndrome is going to look like these, these very juicy, edematous, erythematous nodules that pop up, and they're usually going to be multiple, and they often occur in, in patients, not always, but they many times occur in patients that have underlying abnormalities like leukemia or other things. So clinically, sweet syndrome is going to look like leukemia cutis maybe, or maybe infection much more than it's gonna look like pyoderma gangrenosum. But microscopically, you could theoretically in an early lesion of PG have something that looks similar to sweet syndrome. All right, I am still with you. If you don't specify the species of fungus, how do you write your diagnosis? Well, I like I put there, I just say angioinvasive fungus. If you want to be more detailed, that paper I cited, the, the AMJ Clinical Pathology 2009 paper by Sangoy et al., they have some nice, um, nice wording and terminology in there. I think it's fair to say I see hyphae that have septation and have acute angle branching. And, um, and that's, that's fine to say, or you can say that they are ribbon-like or that you don't identify uh, septations. Now, it's true that if the clinical team is recognizes some of those buzzwords, they may try to make an interpretation uh, for you. And there are times that I make an exception to the rule. If, if it's just, there are, there are occasional scenarios where I think I want to make sure like if I, if I've seen a, a deep fungal infection on the face and it's not a classic presentation for mucor, I may tell them, look, it looks a little ribbon like, and it's on the face. I want to make sure that there's not sinus involvement or cerebral involvement. You know, get a scan and go check this patient right away to make sure that there's no deeper involvement. There are some times I'll make some exceptions, but in the end, I, I make it really clear in my comment that, look, I can describe the fungus all day, but there's no way to know the species for certain um, unless we got either culture or molecular. So that's how I put it. I just am descriptive and, and let them know that. And then I cite that paper in case they give me trouble. I just say, well, here's what the literature says. It says we can't reliably do it. Okay, another differentiation question is differentiating between EM and SJS. So erythema multiforme and SJS really comes down to the clinical. The erythema multiforme is gonna have these targetoid lesions. And then Stevens-Johnson syndrome is gonna have, it can have target lesions also, but it's gonna have um, evolving um, necrosis and sloughing of the skin, um, so up to 10% of the body surface area. And again, it's going to have oral mucosal involvement most of the time. So if they just have targets or lesions and there's no lip or mouth involvement, to me, that's much less likely to be SJS and more likely to be erythema multiforme. Of course, when you get a very, very early presentation of SJS or TEN even, it can start out with a couple targetoid lesions, but it will rapidly progress beyond that into, into the much more severe form that's obvious clinically. So usually if, if they think it's erythema multiforme and not SJS TEN clinically, 
and I see interface alteration microscopically, I'll say, yeah, it's compatible with erythema multiforme. Vacuolar interface consistent with the clinical impression of erythema multiforme because my derm colleagues are really good usually at sorting those out. But yeah, you just have to have that clinical information. And continuing on that same topic, clinical information that can help you differentiate between TEN and JST. JST, oh, that must be Stevens Johnson. I think they mean Stevens Johnson syndrome. Again, the, the clinical info there is the, the body surface area involvement. St Stevens Johnson um, syndrome is gonna be less than 10%. TEN, uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis is gonna be more than 30%. In between, there's this kind of overlap, but I don't, I don't sort those out um, on my diagnosis. I say it's vacuolar interface and consistent with SJS TEN spectrum if that's clinically what they're thinking of. Unless they tell me this is definitely TEN clinically or definitely only SJS, that's fine. But I usually just report it as Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis spectrum. And my colleagues have been fine with me using that terminology. So that's the way that, that we do it in our practice. Okay, here is a... Um... Hypothetical, <laughs> what should our diagnosis be if we see only superficial keratin layers with few attached acantholytic cells attached to it, as you showed in the SSSS epidermolysis bullosa can have similar features? What comment would you make? Well, hmm, that's an interesting question. I guess I don't think of epidermolysis bullosa. I, I'm assuming they, this person means like the actual congenital inherited or the, the congenital form of epidermolysis bullosa, of which there are many different subtypes. This is it a super rare blistering disease that's deal, uh, due to a mutation in a variety of different um, um, molecules that hold the skin together. It can, and it can either happen in the basal layer keratinocytes, in which case the epidermis will lift away and leave the basement membrane and the dermis intact below, or it can be in a variety of different basement membrane proteins or anchoring fibrils. It just depends on the subtype. But the most superficial forms of epidermolysis bullosa usually are going to involve mutation, epidermolysis bullosa simplex, in, uh, usually involving mutations in the keratins uh, 5 and 14, the basal layer keratins. So what that looks like on a skin biopsy actually does not look like stratum corneum with acantholysis. It looks like a completely detached epidermis. In fact, it will look like a subepidermal blister, like bolus pemphigoid, for example, except without inflammation, until you look really closely or do a keratin stain, and you can see there's little tiny fragments at, that are, represent the bottom portion of the basal keratinocytes that are still hooked onto the basement membrane because the split is happening within the basal keratinocyte layer. But you're not going to see acantholysis and it's not going to be stratum corneum. It's going to be basically almost the entire epidermis. Okay. So, and then epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, EBA, which is the acquired epidermolysis bullosa that's autoimmune and happens usually in older adults. Same thing, you're gonna get a, an actual total subepidermal blister, the entire epidermis will be lifted away. You're not gonna see stratum corneum with acantholysis. So I disagree with that. Epidermolysis bullosa, I can't think of any time where that should give you stratum corneum with acantholytic cells. So if I just saw that though, and there, if they just, say stripped off the surface of a blister and I didn't have the underlying skin and all I had was stratum corneum and acantholytic cells, I would say that strips of stratum corneum with scattered acantholytic keratinocytes and that this pattern is often seen in staph scalded skin syndrome and pemphigus foliaceous and that um, depending on the clinical, they could do a repeat biopsy for direct immunofluorescence. And if needed, they could do another full thickness biopsy if, if there was concern for something else. But that's how I would handle it. I'd be descriptive, give a differential of when we can see that pattern and then let the clinical dis team decide how to proceed from there. Okay, let's do a biopsy question. Um, actually, we have a few of these. In a suspected case of pyoderma gangrenosum, do you suggest taking a biopsy from the center and the periphery of the ulcer? Um, I guess you could take a biopsy from both areas. I feel like the, the periphery of the ulcer is the much more important uh, area. Although if you have a clinical concern for a vaso-occlusive process like thrombotic vasculopathy, angioinvasive fungus, something like that, getting a biopsy from the center might be worthwhile too. But I feel that when you're worried about PG, how the edge of the ulcer looks, and again, ideally getting both some of the ulcer and some of the normal skin, which I understand can be hard to do unless you have a big punch tool, um, bigger than a four punch, four millimeter punch, it's, you gotta be really good to get that. And if it doesn't get oriented just right, uh, when we gross it, you might not be able to see the border of the ulcer. So that's why I really like having a small ellipse. It is true when you take a biopsy of a PG patient, 
that you run the risk that they're going to get pathogy response to the biopsy. And I think the derm team has some, some tricks to try to minimize that risk, but still getting a diagnosis and ruling out other causes is usually worth that risk um, to the patient. So, so if you are willing to do both biopsies, I suppose that's fine, but I would, if I had to pick one, I would definitely want the periphery, uh, the border of the ulcer if you're worried about PG. Okay, this is a very generic question. It's just, what is the best site of a biopsy for a skin lesion? Um, it totally depends on what the lesion is and the scenario is. There's no no one right way. It really depends a lot. Okay, let's continue on. Um, do you have an opinion on using frozen sections to differentiate TEN versus EM? Um, you can do it, uh, but but you but again, like I mentioned, you unless you have the clinical, you're not going to be able to tell apart EM, SJS, TEN on either frozen or permanent. So if the if the dermatologist says I can't tell them apart, well, you're not going to be able to either. You can tell them if there's vacuolar interface there. There may be full thickness necrosis, and that of course is great for TEN and SJS, but it can also be seen in erythema multiforme. But yeah, if if the if you're asking though, if the dermatologist says they think it's one of those things, they just want to know if there's vacuolar interface, you can do that on frozen, but I just think that frozens, they tend to get a little vacuolation artifact. And again, I know some places are really good at doing their frozens and do frozens all the time for stuff. But uh, I, I mean, I have good frozen text, but I still prefer to look at uh, uh, permanent embedded, you know, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue is usually going to give you a much better result um, than a frozen section, in my opinion. So if they're willing to wait you know, five or six hours to get that result, which I find many times they're able to to wait that long, they're okay with it, then I feel like that's that's more likely to give us a, um, a useful yield. So I think it's a, a willing trade-off. But if they really want it to be frozen, that's okay. You can do it on frozen. I just think that there's sometimes some technical complications of that. Do you perform routine PAS and GMS stains on all debridements? Uh, no, I do not r routinely perform them. Um, if they tell me that they are, if the clinical team says they're worried about infection, then usually, even if I don't see obvious infection there, I will often go ahead and do um, uh, some, depending on the situation, some of the infectious uh, stains, just to make sure I've thoroughly excluded what they're looking for, unless I find something that's an obvious answer to, to the, the question that they have. Like if I find something else that obviously is causing the ulcer or the you know, the lesion, then then that's fine. But but otherwise, if they're telling me they're clinically worried for infection, I feel like it's a relatively cheap and easy way to add an extra layer of protection against missing an infection there. And then I also will add in, especially if it looks, now if it looks suspicious microscopically for infection, then definitely I'm going to do the, the infectious stains, unless there's already maybe cultures pending, depends on the setting. But usually I'll tell them I'll do my stains. And, and sometimes even when cultures are pending, I'll still do stains. Of course, I'm, I kind of misspoke there. I'm sorry. But the um, the uh, point is, is that, you know, doing the stains can help reduce the risk of there being infection there. But also, if they're really worried clinically, I'll tell them to still correlate with microbial cultures. So, you know, doing extra, you know, a variety of different ways to look for infection can be helpful. Because I've seen times where a specimen that had fungus in it uh, microscopically that we could see on PAS and GMS stain, they sent another piece from that same that same site for culture and it didn't grow anything. Sometimes fungi can actually be challenging to grow, particularly like mucor and rhizopus, some of those, because they have these those thick ribbony hyphae. When the lab chops them up to um, uh, make the culture, it can if it chops the hyphae too finely, they can die. So if you're actually, if, if you're a derm listening to this, you probably already know this, but if you're submitting a piece of tissue and you want a, a culture, particularly for, for fungus like mucor rhizopus absidia, I, I know that that sometimes the lab likes to know that so that they can more be more gentle gentle and leave the tissue in bigger chunks as they're as they're processing it so that they don't uh, mince it up too finely. So I'm not a microbiology lab specialist by any means, but that's what I've been told is that that they will actually approach it differently in in order to try to keep the hyphae um, intact and viable to grow. So, but no, the the sorry that was a kind of a long circuitous answer. But the the final answer is no. I do not routinely perform them. It depends on the scenario. All right, let's see, we've just got time for a few more. Do you perform a tsank test to differentiate disseminated zoster from other bullous lesions? Uh, no, I've actually never used a zinc test. I've never, I've never read one in real life. It's a relatively uncommon thing in the United States, to my knowledge. I think there are some people who do them, but uh, many people don't really do them anymore or have much 
remembrance of how to do them here. In some other countries, I know of some uh, friends of mine in Egypt that has used Zank um, extensively looking for things uh, for different bolus lesions. And, and um, so I think that it's a technique that could be very useful. It's just something that's out of my uh, range of experience because now in, in my practice setting, if I'm worried about zoster or herpes simplex, I can usually, A, I can usually recognize the herpetic viral change on an H and E section. Um, and then also if, if we need to, we have immunostains for HSV and VZV. So in my setting, I'm, I'm blessed with the luxury of having those extra modalities. But if you're in somewhere that's a um, more limited resource setting, I think the Zank prep potentially can be very useful, um, but it's just something that I don't have any experience with myself. If we're looking for a presence of fungus, are there some features that, we, that show up on low power four times that are useful? Yeah, I mean, a couple things. So for, for fungus, like angioinvasive fungus in the setting of um, a neutropenic or severely immunosuppressed patient, if I see a like necrotic epidermis, that, that wiped out pink necrotic epidermis and dermal hemorrhage and no inflammation, and they're telling me it's from a purple area on the skin of an immunosuppressed patient, the first thing I think of is angioinvasive fungus, because that's often that pattern in like bone marrow transplant patients. When they get it, they'll just have no inflammation at all. They'll have hemorrhage because they're low on platelets, and then they'll have fungal hyphae growing out of vessels and growing everywhere. So that's the way it would look in a real immunosuppressed patient on low power, this kind of wiped out pink and red um, skin with necrotic epidermis. The other thing is in, in patients that have a more functional immune system is the presence of abscess and granuloma in the dermis. If I've got abscess and granuloma, particularly if I've got that with pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia of the epidermis, kind of invaginated overgrowth of the uh, epidermis, that right away is, is not angioinvasive fungus, but deep fungus, fungal invasion of the dermis, usually by direct inoculation. That's that until proven otherwise. Leash mania can also cause that pattern of granulomas and abscess with um, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. A variety of fung fungi have a tendency to do that. Coccidiotomycosis can do it. Um, and um, chromoblastomycosis, pheohyphomycosis, a handful of others. But right away to me, that's I think of infect until I can prove otherwise if I see uh, granulomas and, um, and uh, abscess formation together. Okay, well, we are up against the end of our extension time, so I'm going to keep a log of the additional questions that came in. You'll be able to review those later if you'd like. Maybe we can get a few extra on Twitter. People have your handle right there, JM Gardner MD. so make sure to use that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Great presentation today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Have a good hey, day. I and as always, uh, when we leave the se session, I hope that you will complete the evaluation form once again, our survey, just a couple of questions, but we look at those every single day to see how we're doing on different topics, uh, who are the presenters we should absolutely bring back for further sessions. Uh, your feedback is the thing that keeps us going. So make sure to do that every day. Great to have you here as always. And that is going to conclude our session for today. Tomorrow, oh, not tomorrow, Monday, make sure to come back for Dr. Najarian, who's going to be talking about medical liver biopsies. Are you up for the challenge? We'll see you then. Thank you. Good day.